I'm like worming. Um, well, a direct translation from Swedish it is friendly farming. Um, it really means that we're we're trying to get in touch with, with nature, that this is a living earth, that everything is living, that the plants are individuals and we're individuals. And the thing we have in common is that the plants grow and we grow. The common factor is uh, a life force. It, it can be, we don't discuss what this life force is because many people can give it religious connotations and, uh, and Andush, if you ask him, he laughs and says, no, no, it's just called life force. It's, some people call it prana. It's, it's different energies. It's, it's, so we don't put any emphasis on that side. Our emphasis is on practical work. I mean, as, as we're on the earth and we've got two hands and two legs, we must be here to work everything out practically. So that we try to get practical experience and, and bring everything, everything down from the theoretical down to the practical. It's, it's, but this is only supposed to be the basis. It, it's, not, it's not a solution to anything. Mm -hmm. This is just a suggestion how we come close to the earth, how it's possible to get into a position where we can get to know the earth and from there we must work it out ourselves in that place where we're living so this is just a basis for research because conditions may change um, in this part of Sweden in the atmosphere here we are getting we're getting some of the sulfur dioxide even from the Ruhr, Umrol, uh, Ruhr area in Germany so that we're not safe from chemicals we don't use any form of chemicals at all no fertilizers, no composts, but still we can't guard anything. We can't guard against pollution from the air because it comes with the winds and we have predominantly west and southwest winds during the summer. So in a hundred years time the, the atmosphere of the earth may be different and therefore there may be different methods you have to apply to farming. So the idea is that this must be worked out all the time. This earth here has been covered for two years with paper and then the paper will, will break down and go back into the earth but it doesn't matter if it's still lying there like here and we're going to have a, have a look and see how far down the bacteria have got, got into, the, into the earth because normally when you plow, you'll plow to a foot and the, and the ground underneath the plow will be very hard and that means that no bacteria can grow or live below the plow but this way we're going to see how far down the bacteria will live in the earth without ploughing, just by covering up the ground and helping nature to, to, to break down and to build up the bacterial life and the microorganisms in the earth. So we're going to take away the soil layer by layer and see what life we've got in the soil. This was the original covering and it's been broken down and it's going back into the earth. Paper. Cardboard is another good one because the only thing with newspaper, maybe the printer's ink, is, is um, poisonous. So to be on the safe side, it, it's best to use cardboard boxes, cardboard cartons. Why do you want to put uh, a covering on the earth for a year or two? What's the purpose of it? Um, it helps to break down the, the soil. It helps to cultivate the bacteria. It's, it stops the, the, the top from becoming hard. You know, like when, you, when you're going out camping, when you pitch a tent, you know when you take the tent away, the, the grass there is light green and, and it's, it's beginning to break down and it, it's forming good, good soil. And also it helps to cultivate worms. If you cover up a piece of fertile land you, and, and uh, you'll find that you'll be getting worms. Which hands then? This, this earth used to be the bottom of a little lake here and it used to be mud and clay and it was hard before but now you can see it's loose it's just it's loose and the, the air can get inside it and it can help to create bacteria life
Here come the bottom door. And this is the bottom? That's the bottom. Fast the jord in the that, that's, that's, that's the bottom of the lake. That's the bottom layer. That's the clay and it's loose. It hasn't been packed up by a plow or by machines. It, it's, it's Is it loosened up by uh, worms? And have you masked the hair now? Feels the mask in the hair now. Mask, yeah. Ja, visst, det är fullt man gånger i den här. Yes, you said that it's the, the, the worms have gone and ventilated and, and they've kept this loose. Utan mask så hade det inte gått att få till så. It's said without, without worms we couldn't have got this loose, loose earth. It's the worms that have been working because they eat their way through the earth. And as they eat their way through the earth they ventilate and they give... Uh, an, they give back to the earth in the form of a compost. They, they break down the earth and the earth that goes through their body goes back as, as a compost, an enriched compost. So there are animals. We've got our we've got our animals underneath the earth. Our cows. Our cows are inside the earth. Yeah. That's the paper covering. And this is the and this is the loose earth. You know, man, you never need to take bort. Man, you never need to take bort that. No, because you know, when he gets old, he's old, so he's going to be in the rutten and he's going to fall back. You don't have to take away the paper because it'll be broken down sometime. It'll go back to the earth. So most people take it away because it looks untidy, but we don't bother about that. We're not after tidiness here. Not in that. Not in that form, anyway. You see it here, there, fast. Mm. Ovan och nere. Mm. Det, det, det i lakt med plasten. Plasten kommer till att snurra sönder sig. Mm. Yeah. Even, even, even we found that plastic bags disappear after a while in the earth. They, they get broken down. If it's a living earth and we have nails, we found nails that have nearly been broken down. It, it, the different minerals and the different salts in the earth break down everything. It's own medicine for its, for its own soil. We, we then in our turn, eat the healthy products of this healthy soil, and then we have therefore no disease. If the if the earth is full of stones like these big stones here, it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to take them away at all. If you if you put your plants around the edge of the stone, you can imagine that the the circumference of the stone. If you if you pull it out in in, in a line, you you've got more space, so you can actually grow more around a stone and you could if you took it away and also they the stone keeps the warmth it gives warmth to the plant and it also gives energy and it's and uh, if there's any metal in the stone at all it'll be broken down by any of the bacteria that live in the in the green parts of the earth and so so the stones are, there are no hindrances the the only time the stone is any trouble is if you're going to plow and as we don't plow in this farming there's there's no reason why the stones shouldn't be left where they are it doesn't have to be straight lines. Why, why don't you plow? Um, the reason why we don't plow is if you look at the earth, at different levels, there are different microorganisms and different bacteria which have different functions. So, the, say, the, the bacteria that live at half a meter or a meter's depth, they have a special function to fill. Now, if you come with a plow mm -hmm. and you turn the earth upside down, it's chaos. It's like turning a high-rise building upside down. And what happens is that these bacteria that live at the bottom come to the top, and they, and they 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 can't stand ultraviolet rays and they can't stand the sunshine, and so you get dead earth. And all the bacteria that are at the top, which live on the sunshine and which have a special function to fulfill on the on the on the topsoil, they get turned over and put in the bottom and they stop the the process of, of breaking down the earth because they're meant to be on the top and then they, they stop the whole process of of breaking down and getting a good compost soil. And another reason why we don't plow is because when you come with a plow and come with a tractor you pack the earth together and it, and it's very very hard and so no air can get into inside the earth. And we need the air to feed these microorganisms. 
what we have instead of the plough is we have worms. Um, a worm normally in, an, in one day will give you one gram of compost. It, it eats its way through the earth. And if you have a, an area of ground where there are, say, 50, 50 worms to a, a, to a square, square yard, you'll get, say, two acres a year, you'll get 50 tons a year from two acres where there was good worms. Mm. And what they do is, is that they eat their way through the earth and they come up from the bottom and they eat their way up and leave a trail of compost behind them. And all the time they ventilate the soil and keep it, keep it loose. So what we do, we don't plow. We, we just go, we use this type of tool. It should really be shorter, maybe. It depends on your soil. But we don't go deeper than two inches into the soil. Try not to. We just break the topsoil and keep it loose. Mm -hmm. And we keep it loose and, and the atmospheric energy, or, the, or what we call the life force, activates the bacteria. So you can't grow any plants without first having the bacteria which correspond to those plants. And so between your rows of plants, you go twice a week maybe and just keep the earth loose. Um, but if you're living in a, an area where there's constant sunshine and, and there are no fir trees, there's, there's nothing what we call the, the brown earth, mm -hmm. then the best thing to do is to cover the, the ground between your rows with, with grass or hay, because no, no earth should be left bare if, you, if it's a constant sunshine, because the ultraviolet will, will dry out and will kill the bacteria. Mm -hmm. So in, in, the, in Sweden we have to keep the, the forests at bay because they are trying to take over. They, they have a different basis, they have different bacteria. And the bacteria in the forests are not suitable for any of the, for the, any of the life in the plants. On this field we've got carrots. Hello carrots. <laughs> Where are they? Here, they're coming up here. Oh, let's go. <laughs> here. Well, what we've done here is we've covered up four rows. We've covered them up with, with, with hay. We're trying to see that if, if this helps better than the method we use here. The idea is to produce more worms here so they can keep the earth loose. So you cover up the earth here. We don't know how it'll work. It's, it's one of these things, you have to experiment. The reason why we do this, because if you have a, an area like this, it m you may not have time to go over it once a day. Yeah. You should have time to go over it once a day, but we, at the moment we have, we have a lot of things to do, like preparing new, new soils. So we, we're just trying this method. The other method we use is for keeping the earth loose is just by using one of these and just by loosening it between the rows and this means that the air will come in and it will give life to the bacteria and this will start off this cycle of breaking down, giving, giving life. And if, if there are any other grow any other plants growing, we just Anders has, he said that you can use salt. We've used it on our soil that if you find that the, the woods are closing in again, the forests, and you find that there's moss on the ground, he goes and he just throws out uh, salt, and this breaks down the brown, it breaks down the moss, and next year you'll get a healthy green grass growing again. We don't know the long-term effect of this, but salt is always the basis. It's the basis in our body, it's the basis in the earth. If we drink water, we have to have something that, that, that so that our body can make use of this water. And salt, we have salt, and so it, it binds these different liquids in our, in our body so we can make use of them. It's the same thing with the plant, he says. Mm. It's only to take away the brown earth, as we call it. Where, where, the, where the forest is taking over again, because it, the forest doesn't like salt.
because it's it, it, it's it's like yin and yang it's 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 the green and the brown it's it's the salt and the sugar it's it's interesting because in the united states uh recently there have been a lot of controversies about salt using salt on roads and and using salt on foods and people are you know, for some reason, they're thinking that salt is a bad thing. Well, sea salt, sea salt um, has has certain minerals and microorganisms which which can't be found anywhere else. We haven't experimented long enough to to give any definite results, but over the past year, we've seen that it has a definite short-term result that it takes away the brown and it gives life to the green. Um, he he spoke about. Um, farming near the coast, he said that you could use seaweed with salt in it and, and just lay it on the ground as well because it would be naturally taken up by the earth. He, th he said there's, n there's, n there's no risk of, of giving too much salt to the earth because the earth can make use of it. He said instead of giving nitrates to the earth, you give it s something else so that it can in itself change different compounds in the earth to nitrates. So you don't, you don't, you you give the earth salt so it can use this to break different things down. And we found old nails in the earth that have that have begun to rust because they've come into contact with these green bacteria and salt. So there is natural bacteria. There are natural bacteria in the earth that do, do break down metals and 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 so there's there's no need to worry about if you've got stones in your earth, if you've got metal in your earth. Everything can be. Um, put to use with the aid of, of salt and these other a agents that break down. So this is about three years old, this earth here. It looked like the sand pit over the back there. But last year, where this grass is growing, there were only these growths here, these fox foxtails. And then the these die, and, and their, their role in life is to give food to the bacteria and and the and the plants that grow from that is these these herbal and these give the medicine to the earth and once the earth is a living healthy being then it can produce healthy plants and then after like six years down here we get other types of vegetation growing. But now because we have got green bacteria in the, in the soil, in the sand, we're able to get potatoes growing out of pure sand and healthy. So the most important thing to do is when they're growing like this is to give them plenty of air, is to keep, keep the earth loose. And if you've got a sharpened spade with a razor edge, you can also cut into the side here because the potato roots, the ones that collect the minerals and the water go downwards but the where the potatoes grow they go out horizontally so the potatoes will be going out here and you can give, give them air by cutting in at an angle, don't go deep, don't go down but go at an angle but the main thing is to go and just loosen the earth and look after your plants by hand it gives much better results and you've got a contact with the with the plants and make sure that they're covered up so they, they can grow firm <laughs> these these plants are living now there are, there's nitrate in the soil but we began with pure sand, and in pure sand there, there's no nitrates at all. And we haven't used any artificial fertilizers or anything. So the only way it could have come into the earth is from the atmosphere. And the, the, the plant has this capability, this capacity of, of fixing the nitrogen, turning into nitrates. So from sand, we get a green earth. So we've got an earth full of nitrate, nitrate that has been taken directly from the air. So there's no need at all to use any form of artificial fertilizers or any form of animal manure. When, when there's a right environment, things will just grow. Everything grows in the place it's meant to grow. 
and and this is sand and and there was there was air there was good air and it's the beginning of soil and the first things to, to grow from the soil from the from the sand are these and then that starts the whole cycle Det kommer den andra och här kommer den där This is the second to grow. This is the second plant to grow in sand and this is the third and this I showed you yesterday this is a transitional between the the brown and the green when this is functioning in brown soil it's green and when the earth is becoming full of green bacteria and is becoming living it starts to die because it's fill it filled its function and it starts to go red you can see there's the red stalk and then it will just die out. It's filled its purpose in nature and it will go back to the earth where it's grown. So this is a transitional plant. Yes, that's what I'm going to ask. It's red. Yeah. And, yeah. and we have these, these medicinal plants next. This is the fourth one and then we get the daisy growing. So this is, these are daisies that haven't quite come out yet. Um, sen när de går tillbaka, de får falla ner och gå tillbaka. Mm. Då berikar de mikrofloran. Mm. Mik and, and when these when these go back into the earth and break and are broken down, they, they give life and they give food to the microflora, the microorganisms. And that's the important thing. It isn't the the things that grow on the top. It's it's enriching the micro microorganisms and the bacteria in the in the soil because you can't have a plant growing without bacteria. The corresponding bacteria. You have to have a living soil. So when they've put chemicals on the ground, when they've killed the soil, that's why nothing will grow on on, on chemical soil because there's no living life. It's it's artificial soil. This sand here is full of brown bacteria. This this is belongs to the forest. The forest is building up its own life here. We can see we have birch trees beginning to grow here everywhere, and birch is the forerunner of the forest. And we've got other typical forests, we've got plants, we've got heather growing here. And we've got the moss. Now the moss covers the ground, it doesn't let the sunlight in, keeps it cold, so the woods are cold. That's why it grows better here, because the sun doesn't quite get at it from here. It's in the shadow, it's in direct sunlight, so the woods have a difficult time to grow if it, this was in direct sunlight, as we saw over in the sand pit there. So here you've got a typical beginning to a, to a forest. You've got the brown bacteria and you've got the, the brown plants and the brown trees that are beginning to grow. And over the other side of the road we can show you what happens when you change the brown into the green. What we've done here to help the sand here, which was full of brown bacteria, you can see it's the same, you've got, you've got your pine growing. We took salt. I mean, I talked about salt before that it, it's one of the basics. In there is salt in the earth, there's salt in your body. So we've taken sea salt and we've just thrown it around. And you can see that the moss here is beginning to be broken down, and these plants here are beginning to get turn red. So they're going, they're going back. They're being broken down, and you can see that. Over on the other side, there was no grass growing. But no grass grows in the brown, but here you can see there's new tufts of green grass just coming up. And if you look over here, this is what this is last year. Last year, this piece of ground was exactly the same as the piece of ground there. And we've put salt on it. And after one year, the brown has disappeared and now you've got this this grass growing and I'm saying in Sweden we have a brown earth and we have green earth the brown earth belongs to the forests and in the in, in the brown earth no, no green things grow you never see grass in the forests and um, the green zone or the, the green earth is, is the meadows it's, it is where our plants the, the the vegetables which are meant for human beings to eat that's where they grow and in, in countries where there's desert and where there's constant sun and it's very, very hot, the idea is to keep the sunlight at bay. You should never have 
open earth as we have here, you cover it up. And, and if you cover up soil as well, it also helps to cultivate worms because they like the atmosphere. And so the best way to keep your earth loose is to cultivate worms. We work with nature, not against it. We try to use all we can so we can help n nature to help herself as well in, in where the conditions are difficult. If we go down here, we can see how we start cultivating land which hasn't been used before, which is in quite a, a, a bad state where a normal farmer wouldn't attempt to do anything or he'd take a tractor and he'd try to do it. So all this land here can be turned into this within a matter of hours. I can show you down here. Here is a is a spade which we've cut the edge off. And this is a razor edge here. It makes it much easier for cutting. See we don't we don't dig with a spade at all. We don't go deep into the earth. We only go two inches into the earth. We use this spade for going underneath the roots. We use it here. Under, underneath. And then we turn the clods upside down so it, they'll, they'll, they'll go back to the earth quicker this way. And then we have our basis for our, for our farming. We use this as the base. And then we can just, from an ordinary grassland, we can just take earth and just put it straight on, like this, say two inches deep. So, so you turn it over and then you put uh, uh, grassland dirt on top of it. Um, well, you can take the earth from anywhere. It doesn't make any difference. You can use your sourest earth, your 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 worst earth. This earth has been taken from land which was under water for a long time, and it's very sour, and it still belongs to the woods. You can see there are pieces of twigs in it. And then we just put the pota the potatoes straight on it. I sh see. Here. So the potato is planted, pressed in, and then we take earth which has had grass growing on it. All earth which has had grass growing on it has green bacteria in it. And then we can put this on top. And it's like a culture. Once it gets into this other brown earth and mixes together, you're, you're you'll get a good compost earth, because th this is sa mostly sand, and sand is the basis for earth. Everything begins with sand. You have sand, and then you get your grass growing, and the grass goes back into the sand, and gradually and gradually, it, it, you get a finer earth. And all you need to do is just pack it a little. And we use it like this, because then the, the warmth of the sun can come into the potato. So you can, you can um, start with just ordinary grassland and, and while you're cultivating it, you can also get a yield. So this first year we've taken this area here, we've cultivated it, and at the same time we're getting potatoes. And Why do you have this sand here and this darker uh, earth here? Is this richer? No, this is not richer. This is. This is a myth that, that black earth is richer. It depends. This earth, as you see here, it's, it's like a book. You can still read it. it. It belongs to the woods. It's got pieces of trees in it. it it's, it's very sour. But when we use this earth together with this, then you have the bacteria coming in and you're producing a good compost earth. Uh, you were mentioning it's also a factor of sugar and turpentine? Um, Yes, the, the earth that belongs in the woods has a conservative in it, which is turpentine. And that keeps all the trees alive, it, it, it keeps everything in the woods and the forest preserved. And the natural preservative 
in the green areas, in the meadows, is sugar. Um, this, for example, this grass, you can in, in, in the springtime and in the, in the autumn, you can, you can cook the roots of these and get a syrup. Very sweet. So the, all, all these grass give off sugar. And potatoes, why we use potatoes? Because potato is, is one of the few plants that seems to give more to the earth than it takes out. So when you begin to farm on new earth, uh, use the potato, because its root system helps to break down the earth, and it, it, it takes its, most of its energy from somewhere else. Are there other plants that do that? Um, we think the potato is the most effective, and then normally we go on to carrots afterwards. But so far, we've only been experimenting with potatoes. It's something which can be experimented with. The whole idea of friendly farming, as it's called in Swedish, is that we get near to nature, we get close to nature, we try to learn its structure and its laws, and then we adapt them in that, in, in that special zone, because all different parts of the world are divided into different zones. They have different climatical conditions and different different situations where you can't, the methods we use here may not be able to be used somewhere else, but the principles, be, principles behind them can be used to experiment and do research. So this is just meant as a basis. And as I mentioned before, if, if you were in a very hot country where there was no brown earth, then you would cover up between the rows, you'd cover it with grass so that the sun wouldn't kill the bacteria, and it wouldn't dry out the earth so much. Another important thing is to keep the earth loose. Very loose. I can show you what happens if you do. We've got potatoes which we've had up for one week now. There's nothing that's, there's nothing that's harmful. People think that weeds should be got rid of. But weeds are really what we call help cultures, they, they help us. So they, they, they take up nitrogen from the air as well. I mean, they're, they're giving nitrates to the soil, they're helping the soil. So like a weed, all you do is you'd leave it there to go back in and you'll, you'll, you'll let it grow, you'll let it help the earth. But when, when everything is starting growing, you can, you can pull them out again. So you don't have to hate these, you, you know, you, you love all these because they're helping the earth. They're helping the soil. There's nothing, there's nothing that you can really call a weed or anything which is bad. These, look at them, they're so healthy. They're just, Anders and I, when we came and looked at these, we said that they're boasting, that they're healthy. They're shouting out that they're green and healthy. How old are they? These plants, I say two weeks they've been up above the ground now. Uh -huh. And what happens is they come up about this much to begin with. And then we go and we take away the weeds. And we don't put the weeds on a compost heap. We put the weeds where they came from and they go back down. And we don't call them weeds, we call them helpful cultures because nothing exists without being of some help. So these so-called weeds help. And another way of carrying out tests to see what type of soil you have is not by getting earth and sending it to a laboratory because that's a dead method. We tell by looking at the different weeds we have, or cultures. This, for example, is a green version. That is what it looks like. And this is somewhere between the green and the brown earth. This exists where there's both green and brown. But where we've got green bacteria, we see further over here where these black currant bushes are, it's turning red. This is a dark, it's turning red, and it's, and it's, it's losing its fight. And so next year it won't be here anymore. So the idea to see what sort of earth you've got is, is to know the different vegetation that grows in your area and to know at what stage it grows. Now if we look at these potatoes, what we do, we go and we help them. We give them earth. And we've noticed that if we don't do anything with the potatoes, they grow very, very slowly. Now, if I'm um, to go like this, now they'll grow an inch or two overnight now. If they were so big, they'd grow to this much. We found out everywhere 
that if if we look after them and uh, love them, but but it's something that we give them energy. We wake them up. We we tell them that they have to do something. Um, they they respond. It it's it's. It's something which we've got practical experience of, but concrete facts. What were you going to say about uh, growing in the desert and um, the water? In this part of the world, we don't have much problem with deserts. We have a lot of sand. Now, potatoes can grow in pure sand. We have potatoes which we dropped on the driveway by accident, and now they're lovely plants. <laughs> it's in pure sand, or they can have it in the sourest. They'll grow anywhere. They'll grow anywhere and they give and give all the time. Um, deserts. Anders Bjornsson, the, the farmer who we're, we, we take it in first hand all our knowledge, he has a theory about desert farming. He says that he could transform the Sahara Desert back into a, a, a fertile plain. He says that if you're working with desert farming, if you take a desert, around here, that you must work from the outside, you mustn't work from the inside. The idea is that you try to get the grass to grow. There is, most people think that the way to, to make the desert grow is to bring in water, but there is already water there. There is ground level water which is, which is underneath. He has a theory that, that deserts are like scabs. Now if you cut yourself a scab will form. It's the same thing on the earth, they're scabs and, and they're there to serve a purpose. Protect to protect the water. He says nothing's growing, therefore no, none of the ground level water will, will come up. He says it's like the, the nerves inside your body, they'll look after the balance of your different organs in your body, because that's their natural function. It's the same thing. Now if you were to cultivate the outside and you'll start to grow grass, if you start growing grass around here, then the grass would have a need, nature would have a need for water. Mm -hmm. And as the earth is a living being and it's a living body, as soon as part of it needs water, it will automatically feed, feed this part with water. So the ground level water will come up to give water to the parts of its body. It's like when the scab's gone, the skin, new skin comes. Well, the new skin is the grass mm -hmm. and everything goes back again. So he means that you don't gain anything by watering. And we don't water or irrigate anything here. The best time to water is when it rains, strangely enough. It sounds strange, but these plants are very sensitive and they're like barometers. They will only collect water when it's low pressure. So if there's high pressure in the atmosphere, if you water, the water will just either evaporate into the air again, or it will go back right down in the earth, and it will miss the plants. Oh. So, so the best time to water is when it's raining. But if you keep the ground loose, then any water that's around, or any dampness in the atmosphere from dew, it will automatically be drawn into the dry earth. And every night it gets yes. wet. So yes, yes. We had um, two months of drought last summer, and we, we got by this by going every day and just and loosening the topsoil. Now, if it was a hard topsoil, that no, no air could get into it, mm -hmm. and it would sort of stifle any life there, and, and no water could get into it. None of the none of the dew. It, it, it doesn't lose any water because it's open. Mm -hmm. If it's hot, then the groundwater level recedes. It it it's, it it recedes. It's it's no. It's no use throwing water on when you think it's right, because the plants know when they should take up water. The reason why we've got these supports here is, is partly to protect the young peas from, from birds. We've had a lot of trouble with pigeons that have been eating. They've eaten the corn we had here, and once they know that there's food, they'll start on other things, and they've chosen these peas. And another reason is that It'll give them something to climb on, and then they'll f it'll form a sort of a trellis work, and you'll get a sort of a hedge of, of peas. And so these, it's, it's, well, it's a protection as well as a, as a support. These type of peas don't grow that high, but it, also, it gives them that added support, because we're up on a plateau here, as you can see. The oak tree will begin to 
try and get some more trees by using the root shoots here. The same method as we use the rhododendrons. Instead of getting a rhododendron bush, you'll get a rhododendron tree if you take the shoots that come under the earth. If you take a cutting from a, from a tree and put it in the earth, you, you won't get a, a, a secure and, and solid growth. His methods are that every life comes from underneath the earth. And if you're going to take a cutting, you'll have to take something that grows from underneath the earth. And the same with the black currant bushes, you, you, take, you take those shoots that come from the roots, that come from under the earth, and instead of getting a, a, a black currant bush, you'll get a black currant tree. Last year we took those same shoots, or the similar shoots, and put them at an angle in the ground here, as you can see. And now they've taken root. So we've taken a cutting from underneath the ground. Now they've taken root and we've got an oak tree coming here. So you can use this method. You don't need acorns, you don't need, you don't need cuttings from, from the actual tree. You take it from the roots. At the end of this year, you'll cut, you'll cut it here. And that means that, the, that the, the tree will be shocked and will shoot up another a root shot here. Mm -hmm. And so you'll get two. And that's how you do it. And you've got your one already. So you cut it off here, and then it'll automatically be shocked into producing another one. Och här är seringa. Och det är samma, det är samma historia med den. Alltså det är den som växer där, som jag har mm. lagt här. Ja. Is that mulberry? Lilac. The, the lilac tree is the same. That's a tree, it's not a bush, it's becoming a tree. It's the same here. We take the shoots that come from the ground and do exactly the same and cut them here and then new shoots will come and they'll become trees and not bushes we're trying to we're trying to get trees out of all these these uh, growths they, they've got um, gooseberries here and black currants which have sown themselves by natural methods. And what And Anders does to get these black currant plants we see here, he plants them at a special angle. He plants them. He plants them at an angle like, say this was the, the black currant, he plants them like this. And then he, he cuts them. And so it shocks the plant and it shoots up um, roots, growth from its roots, and so you get a you get a shoot coming up from the root here, and he'd cut it again, and it'd shoot more of its root, and it'd come it again. So in the end, you've got a black, one, from one black current, you've got different shoots coming up, and then you take a spade and you just cut in between, and so you've got a natural method of, of, of multiplying your black currents. The black currants, the shoots that you put into the ground, are they roots or are they twigs? They're twigs. It's um, there are there are, there are different methods, but he's he's experimented, and he's 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 found that this is the best method. These are from the roots. Mm. These are these are cut from underneath the earth. These are the ones that, when you cut back, they shoot up roots, and then you cut down, and then you plant them out. And we're going to plant these out on the row above this row. We take it at that angle. Whenever you're planting anything, you dig at this angle. You never dig straight down. And we're going to plant these at an angle as well. And so we lay the we lay the root there. These are the sh these are the stems that have come up from the roots. You mean the stems after you've shocked a plant? We 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 you clip. You cut back, you cut back one of these plants, 
and immediately it's shocked and it shoots up a root. And, and, that's, what, and that's what you're planting again. Sorry? That's what you're planting now. Yes, or they can become trees in themselves. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a way of multiplying. What's on it? You are saying you want to make it, so you can use it again. Yes. You can use it again. These should be... Då får de inte kapas utav förrän på våren mm. när det har börjat. Du vet yeah. hur det de börjar att ta ut alltså. They should kapas. always be planted in the fall. In the autumn. Mm -hmm. And then you only cut them back in the spring. Because you cut them back in the spring before they're beginning to grow. Så den här står bara kapar om våren två år här igen. So yeah. these are being cut back in the spring and they're already beginning to shoot up here and next year they'll begin to shoot up the roots when they've been cut back mm -hmm. so they'll, be, they'll become they'll grow here the first year and then when you cut them back again then the, the roots will start coming up du vet detta är en kist detta det får inte bli om det ska bli en en stam Då måste det gå ett år och sen klipper man här och då kommer det att det. Yeah. Yeah. These, these are only just really small twigs. So you have to keep cutting them back so they get thicker and thicker and so you've got more of a branch like structure. To make these the more you cut this back the the, the thicker it'll get and the more tree like it'll get. How many years does it take uh, to bear fruit? Efter hur många år kan du få frukt av dem här? Ja, det blir frukt samma år som det går upp, ser du väl det. Alltså, den stammar som har gått upp, de, de blommar ju samma yeah. året. Och andra året är det frukt på grenarna som man klippte in där borta. Ja. Yeah. Um, well, these were put in this year. The others were, were a one year old and you get the fruit the same year. See, it's not a big bush, it's more of a tree, so you don't get a bush-like growth with a lot of berries. Yeah. Mm. So, in, in the fall, Till hösten kan man klippa under dem. Ja, ja, då klipper man under jord. Det som, man klipper det på roten var det ögat har bildats och denna har gått mm. ut. Mm. So in the fall you, you, you cut these below the earth level. Below the earth. And then you'll get one of these. And with this you'll plant it out as we showed before. And then as you cut this back you'll get your roots. So to get you to get your material to multiply, you'll you'll take it from underneath the ground. You get a pair of scissors and cut it underneath, and you've got this. And then you plant it at the angle, and then you'll cut back, shock the roots, and they'll shoot up. And then you cut back, and you'll get more that way. These were planted last year, and in order that they can give fruit this year, you have to take away some of the leaves. The top leaf is to be left because we're trying to get a tree out of this. But these leaves you leave there to go back into the soil. Or if you want, you can make wonderful tea out of these. You just put them in water. Cook the, boil the water and put these in water. And, um, yeah, so it doesn't matter, or you just eat them straight away. They're beautiful. Because before before the fruit's been formed, the life force has been concentrated in, into the into the leaves. First, it was in the root in the spring, and then it's come up, and it's gone out into the leaves. And then, when the fruit comes, the life force is concentrated into the fruit. So that so the berries you pick directly from the bush or the tree and, and put them in your mouth that they're a hundred times more nutritious and, and and taste much better than than the berries you, you can get anywhere else. So direct it should be directly because then there's no loss. You take it directly, eat it straight off the off the. These bushes have grown wild. 
and you can see that they're, they've been they're forming big bushes and this is the old method this is the old of style of of letting the bushes grow and then you'll get a bush which is absolutely overladen with fruit and and not not concentrated in nutritional value if you look what we're doing here you can see we're getting a more tree-like growth this one here is three years old and you can see that it's much thicker here it's like it's becoming like a tree and, it, and it's got enough strength to hold itself up and all that strength will be concentrated in the berries this one here is one year old and it's also becoming thick you can see here so that's after one year you'll be getting this tree-like growth from the bush. Here are the berries forming already. There are not so many as on the bush, but they're, they're much better quality. And that's what we're after. We're after a higher quality, not a higher yield. Så det är meningen att de ska bära sig själv, de får aldrig lägga sig som de blir. Mm. Och så är det meningen att de ska odlas i storodlingar så ska de odlas i långa rader med en två meter emellan. Mm. And so if you're going to have um, a line of these, if you're going to have many bushes, have them in lines with about five foot in between them. And get them tree-like because then they can support themselves, otherwise they're bushes that are not, not, not stable at all. They only do this once a year, in, in the beginning of the season. It's so that it won't become just a big bush, so that you get everything concentrated, so you'll get better quality. They're not really interested in how many berries you can get on one bush. They're in, interested in the quality and the nutritional value you can get into it. <laughs> They're cutting back these plants so that the life energy will go into into the um, berries, and so it don't it won't just become a big bush. All the life force will be concentrated, and you'll get a beautiful quality in the berries. <laughs> He said that why they cut them back is because that then the um, the, the um, power of vegetation will be stronger than the power of production in the berries. He's, 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 he said that if you just let it grow, because it, it's a plant, it will just grow and grow and grow. But if you redirect the life force in a natural way, that it will concentrate. As I said before, it will concentrate and give you a, a very high quality black currant. And this strain of black currant, it's it's um, it's the same strain as. They used to make the uh, wine of the gods before in, in the old uh, Nordic legends, or legends, it, I don't know if you can call them legends. But. What they used to do, if it was raining, he said that the um, Finnish immigrants that lived here before, they, they used to have sort of, I call it magic, that the old Finnish farmer, if the rain was coming and he wanted to, to keep dry, He'd take out his knife, he'd spit on it three times, and he'd make a, a sweep in the air, cut the clouds in two, and they'd, they'd, they'd part, and they'd go on either side of him, and he'd, he'd be able to continue drying. Den andra som är med spelar i detta som har rida på det. Det gör det samma vem som spelar rollen, det måste spela. Ja, ja. Jag kommer ihåg det där som tockar fan för det som att han talar en bra svenska. Det var tvungen att ha lärt sig ordentligt. Och så är det med en annan om man, sån där saker, om man inte har fått gjort ordentligt. Alltså lärt sig ordentligt, då blir det ju fler gånger. Um, here we've got a, quite a large expanse of carrots. And there's always a problem if you have the same type of vegetable over a large area because it, it attracts different bugs. This may attract the carrot fly. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to plant different things that will keep them away, that will counteract. And this, this is grass onion. And we're hoping that the, the grass onion will keep away the flies, will keep away the bugs. And so most vegetables have another vegetable which they can grow side by side and, and it is sort of a reciprocal that they protect each other 
But there's another aspect. If you have any sick plants or sick vegetables, it's nature's law that they have to disappear. So a healthy plant, a completely healthy plant, will never be attacked by bugs. So if your, your plants are being attacked by bugs, it's, it's because you've not got a healthy growth there. Because life is health when it refers to, to the soil. And so in, in fact nature is doing what it should do. It, it's clearing away all disease and sickness in, in, in its own environment. It's cleaning its own house. But in order to eat, we have to sort of protect even, even those plants that are not perfectly healthy because we haven't managed to produce a perfectly healthy plant yet. What we do with potatoes, we take potatoes or, or any other vegetable we want to get a healthy specimen and we plant it in very difficult conditions, in very bad conditions, and we take those different plants which, which make the most of it, which, which, which are the strongest, the healthiest, at the end of the growing season. So that's another way of getting healthy plants. And, is to put them in difficult conditions, and the ones that make it, you use those the next year, set them out like potatoes. Um, another thing about friendly farming is that it's based on need. It, it's a natural law that nothing happens without there being a need for it. If you're hungry, you need to eat. And it's the same thing here. Um, if you're doing anything with the soil, there must be a need for it. You must know why you're doing things. We keep the soil loose because the air needs to get in and the, and the bacteria need the air. It, it's, everything's built on need. Well, we're making a row for the potatoes. It's easiest to have a piece of wood as a guideline and use the spade, but don't go, direct, don't go deep. Go at, a, at an angle like this. We're not going to bury the potatoes, we're going to plant them. Mm -hmm. yeah. This earth is rather loose, so you, you, could use, you could use this to rake it up. But if you've got hard earth, you use a spade. We're showing you now because you can use a spade in any condition, but if it's this loose, you can use this. So first you make a row. Now can you talk for a demonstration? So if it is hard earth, you, you can go and loosen it up in the, in, in the bottom of the row. So it's sort of a soft bed for the potato to lie on. Då kan man ta och ställa, sälta den här som demonstration. Då ska vi visa den hur potatisen ser ut här. Ja. Ja, jag menar ta den framför så han kan få se hur potatisen ser ut i storlek alltså. Sänk lådan så han... These are black potatoes. These originally from Russia. It was a strain that was brought in by an immigrant to Sweden. These come from the Caucasus, and these black potatoes have twice as much starch in them as other potatoes. Normally, we use Swedish potatoes, a variety, two or three varieties, but we're trying now these black potatoes to see if there's any difference in nutritional value. And uh, we've already got the eyes. We've already got little growth here. So when you plant them you have these pointing upwards to the sky. What because if, if you, you, if you uh, turn them upside down, they've got to fight. What's that? 1720, they come here. 1720. Ah, the first, the first variety of these came into Sweden in 1720. Och ju fler 20 centimeter för kan vi sätta i mellan dem. So you, it's a span from the thumb to the little finger, about that, that distance between, or a little more. So we have a hand span between the potatoes, but between the potato rows, we have at least three feet between. Because later on you'll need this earth here to heap up to the potatoes when they start coming up. You'll be taking earth from the center to the sides of both rows. So you need enough earth in the middle to heap up the potatoes as they grow. Mm -hmm.
är det som skrattar till ditt egen tur? Du ska jag komma efter och då. Jag tar upp mig rakt med det. Därför för våra tidkommande så kan man ju packa och fyra lätt jord. Så du just cover the potatoes up afterwards. You don't, they don't go very deep. It's just shallow in the ground. They don't need to go deep. Because they need the warmth. They need the warmth up near the top. Just cover them up. And these potatoes were, were put into the ground 10 days ago. And they've already come up to this size. So if you bury them, it'll take much longer for them to come up. They've got a much harder fight before they can come up and the leaves can start taking energy from the atmosphere. How many people have worked on this land? Just him, Folky alone. One man. Just one man alone has done this. So I mean, even though it's quite a large area, it, it, it's you. You don't need many people. Not with these. Not with using these natural methods. Machine tractors. It, it looks as though they're doing an effective job, but it, really they're, they're making life much harder because you have to do so many different things to to uh, make up for the amount of damage that the the, the machines have done. And so, if you're working on a friendly basis from the beginning, therefore you only have to do things once. And he's he's used these methods solely. He he's he's never used a machine, as I said, and he's never used any animal manure or anything. And we're going to go and look at his potatoes. He specializes potatoes, and he said he's probably got the best in Sweden. But we have problems with animals here. We have with stoats. So in the winter time, when the snow is here up here, and they press the snow down with this level, and, and the stoat usually goes under under the snow, and when it comes to here, he can't get through. So he can't get through to damage the plants. In this in this part of the world, they usually have trouble. Anders has had trouble with stoats as well, but they've constructed this to keep him away. What are stoats? It's a weasel. Oh. Like mole? It's, no, it's it's sort of a it's a it's a weasel. It's it's a long, uh -huh. sort of elongated rat. So he said that every time it snows, you pack just the snow under here, so you've got a wall. The snow and, and, and nothing can get through it because in the winter a lot of animals travel under snow. How are they going to damage the plants in the winter time? They, um, they burrow and um, they get at the roots. And these are uh, currants and these are plants. Uh, yes, these these are black currants. We look at. We're not completely against machines. Sometimes. They can be of use if, if they're of a friendly nature. We're, we're against tractors and, and machines that don't pay any attention to what they do. But we have a problem. If we're, we're trying to cultivate an area the size of this, and if we're trying to sow, we have to have the rows. And that normally I'd use this. And I'd have the rows here. And then here, we'd plant the seeds, and then we'd pack the earth on top. Sometimes we'd go with a wheelbarrow over the rows just to pack it down. But with an area this size, we, we tr thought that we could maybe make something, make a machine. And so we've come to this conclusion, just made out of old pieces of timber. This is uh, upside down right now. Mm. Oh, I see. And and you, we can adjust the, the the width between the rows here by these screws. And all you do is just to, to pull it. 
one person can pull it. And we've used it for here, but the only problem is maybe it, it goes too deep. This is the first year we've used it, and we find that we may have to modify this. It may be going too deep, because what happens, you'll get this. You'll get a wall. And, and, the, and the earth on the side here is very hard packed. And if it's very hard packed, you will not get any life coming into the soil. So what we've got to do now, we're going over the field and we're taking away this wall, like this. Mm -hmm. We're using... This is what we've got to do. We've made a mistake or we've learnt by experience. Now we've got to take away this, this wall. So the only trouble is, by using this machine, it packs the earth. Now if I use this, we'll get a very loose row. Because it, 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 it makes a furrow, but at the same time the earth is loose. So a machine should be adapted to, to the conditions where you're farming. If, if the machine can be used in a friendly way, if it can be used in a natural way, then, it, then we think it's all right. We'll, we'll have technical aids if they're of a friendly nature, but we won't use anything which just goes along without respect for nature and turns it upside down. But I personally think that, that it's much better to have living contact. That's why we have no shoes and socks on, because we work with bare feet. It, it's, it's, it's contact with the earth, it's contact with your environment. And it also gives you energy. There's energy you're giving to the earth and you're getting from the earth. And it also... Anders had pneumonia once. And the doctor said to him that the best thing he could do was to go barefoot. Was to take off his shoes and socks and walk in the, in the earth. And um, he usually works bare feet. And also, if you have no shoes and socks on, you know where you're going. Sometimes you can stand on plants, and because you don't know what's underneath your feet. You should always be aware of, of, of what's around you, both aware of what's up in the air and also what's underneath your feet, so you don't step on things. And also, it's much nicer. It's, it's lovely. <laughs> it feels good. It feels good, yeah. Ja just det. Jo jag förstår hur du tänker. Då skulle man ha lite kortare skaft också så här. Nej, skaft är inte bra för man får framför sig så det. Det är bra om man har för mycket upp och ner för att bli ett jävligt tryck. Ja just det. Om man använder hela längden på skaftet så... Ja detta måste vi prova. Ja just det. Ja kan, ja. Ja du vet om vi ska få in luften så är jag syr och får över på det här sättet.